But now in Christ Jesus, you who once were far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ, for he is our peace. In his flesh he has made both groups into one and has broken down the dividing wall that is the hostility between us. He has abolished the law with his commandments and ordinances so that he might create in himself one new humanity in place of the two, thus making peace and might reconcile both groups to God in one body through the cross, thus putting to death that hostility through it. So he came and proclaimed peace to you who were afar off and peace to those who were near. For through him, both of us have access in one spirit to the Father. So then you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are citizens with the saints and also members of the household of God, built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets with Christ Jesus himself as the cornerstone. In him, the whole structure is joined together and grows into a holy temple in the Lord, in whom you also are built together spiritually into a dwelling place for God. Thus ends the reading. I've been asked to reflect on this particular reading and to sort of set the atmosphere for prayer and reconciliation this morning. When I read Paul's letter to the church at Ephesus, it reminds us that he's speaking to a church that's very much like our own. He's speaking to a church that's going through tremendous changes. He's speaking to a church where folks who used to be in the minority find themselves increasingly now in the minority. He's speaking to a church that is divided by race, ethnicity, ethnicity, social class. Paul is addressing a group of Jewish Christians who now more than ever have to look across the pews and see people who they thought were not worthy singing the same songs, praying the prayer, same prayers, uh, governing on the same church councils, leading in the church. But instead of focusing on the differences, Paul urges the community to focus on the unity that we share in Jesus Christ. Paul writes, but now in Christ you who were once far off have been brought near in the blood of Christ, for he is our peace. He has abolished in flesh, he has abolished the law and the commandments, thus making peace with both, so that he might reconcile us both to God in body through the cross. Paul says that in Christ he has ended the hostility that has endured between the two groups and that now we have a spiritual foundation in Christ, a foundation laid by Jesus himself, who is the cornerstone. Paul speaks of the peace that we have in Christ Jesus. Instead of building walls of division and separation and exclusion, Paul talks about groups coming together, saying that Christ has torn down the walls of hostility, that has existed between Jews and non-Jews and created one new humanity. Paul would expand upon this theme of oneness that we share in Christ by saying to the Galatians in chapter three, for as many of you as were baptized into Christ have been put on Christ. And now there is neither Jew nor Greek. There's neither slave nor free. There's neither male nor female, for we are all one in Christ Jesus. I heard somebody say amen. amen. But perhaps even more importantly for our conversation this morning, in verse 16, the Apostle Paul reiterates the, ap the apostolic notion that Christ's death on the cross was redemptive for everyone, resulting in not only the forgiveness of sins, but in re re reconciliation to God. Only in Christ can, be re can we be reconciled to God and to each other. And only in Christ can we remove the hostility that exists between us. The anointed apostle tells us that the final result 
of the one supreme act of atonement is that we, Gentile Christians, are no longer strangers and aliens, but now we are members of the household of God. That's good news this morning. He said that our household is built upon the foundation of the apostles and the prophets with Christ Jesus himself as the cornerstone. It is a sad fact that we are a divided community, a divided society, that we are divided by race, by color, by class, by age, by sexual orientation, by political affiliation, by social status. It's a shame that we have to look at the news and see and hear the, the discourse, the public discourse that has become so, so hostile. It seems that we live in a society where the poor are not treated equally, where a whole lot of folks are living in fear. Immigrants are living in fear. People of different sexual orientation are living in fear. Folks who don't have adequate health care are living in fear. Paul's exhortation to the church is for reconciliation. You know that the church is on the front line of the battle, this cosmic battle between good and evil. Paul suggests that we wrestle not against flesh and blood, that the problem is not color, the problem is sin, the problem is evil in heavenly places. And so Paul would suggest that we need to reconcile each other in Christ. We have a tremendous job to do. Our actions need to reflect the fact that we are ambassadors of Christ, that we are called to be peacemakers in a society that promotes hostility and division. In 2 Corinthians 5, Paul writes, all this is from God who through Christ reconciled us to himself and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. In Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against us and entrusting to us the message of reconciliation. Church, we have a great opportunity today. We have an opportunity to show that we are of God. Our sin can begin to model the behavior that Paul lifts up in Ephesians 2. We can be a, a synod that will bring glory to God and to the ELCA. We can begin the process of reconciliation that Paul is lifting up. We can rebrand. We can change the narrative. We can be the church that is breaking down walls that separate male and female, bond and free, young and old, rich and poor, liberal and conservative, traditional and contemporary, Democrat and Republican, alt-right and ultra-left, pro-choice and pro-life. We can be a church of reconciliation. We can put Christ above culture. We can build bridges, bridges of community, bridges of inclusion, not walls of division and isolation and exclusion. We can welcome the stranger. We can love one another. We can treat others with respect. We can pursue collaboration instead of isolation. We can do as Micah says in chapter 6, verse 8, we can do justice. We can love mercy. We can walk humbly before our God. We can speak truth to power. We can act as if black and blue lives matter that blue, brown, and yellow lives matter, that white and red lives matter, because all lives matter in God's eyes. We can demonstrate with action that we affirm the priesthood of all believers, that there are no big eyes and little U's in SEPA or in ELCA. We can continue to trust God and stand on the promises of God. I realize that what I'm saying is not easy, that we are seeking to be peacemakers in a society and in a culture that doesn't want peace but seems to want to promote war. God never said that it would be easy. The trick of the enemy, the best tool that he has is discouragement, and we all get discouraged sometimes. I'm reminded of the prophet Elijah after he experienced a great victory on Mount Carmel when he called down fire from heaven and killed 450 prophets of Baal. He received a message from Queen Jezebel that the next day the same thing would happen to him as soon as she could catch up with him. And it says Elijah went on the run fearing and discouraged and he wound up in a cave all alone. And when God asked him why he was in a cave, he said that all of the other prophets had been killed and he was ready to die himself. 
He thought that he was all alone, but God said, no, not so. He said, I have 7,000 others who have not bowed down to Baal. In other words, we are not in this work alone. God is with us. There will always be a remnant. We can be a remnant. We can be a reconciled congregation. Solomon said in 2 Chronicles 7 and 14, the promise that God gives to us, if we would just hold on to his unchanging hand. He said, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven. I'm saying to you that there's hope today. We can be reconciled to each other today. We can love one another today. We can be better today than we were yesterday. We can move forward in faith together if we want to. The choice is ours. We need to pray. There will be prayer stations here this morning. I believe in the power of prayer. I believe that God answers prayer. I believe that when we've done all that we can do, we can still pray. And so I invite those of you who believe in prayer, who want to change things, who want this synod to be transformed, to be different, to be more welcoming, more loving, that I invite you to come and to pray. I'm going to ask the prayer leaders to come. There'll be two stations up front. We invite you to come and to pray. Pray for your church. Pray for the synod. Pray for the ELCA. Pray for the kingdom of God on earth. Pray for the government and the people that God has placed in charge of governments. Pray for the world. We stand in the need of prayer. If we ever needed the Lord before, we need him now. Won't you pray?